title the message this morning, Dead to the Law. Dead to the Law. Romans chapter 7. Notice what Paul writes as he continues uh, from chapter 6, his theme. He goes on and he says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Give us an understanding in Your Word this morning. Teach us Your way. We ask that You would give us illumination and enlightenment, Father, from Your Word this morning. Write it upon our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Lee Harvey Oswald was the former Marine sharpshooter who was arrested and charged with the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963. Realized that there's probably not a lot of us that maybe remember or were even alive during that time. Some of you were. Oswald denied all the charges. In fact, he was never condemned for the crime for which he was accused. In fact, he never even have to show up to court. Two days after he was charged and accused of this crime, he was set free from all the charges for which he was accused. You see, as Oswald was taken from the city jail to the county jail, he was severely wounded by a gunshot. Dallas nightclub operator Jack Ruby had delivered... Uh, the blow, the gunshot was to his, uh, his abdomen, Lee Harvey Oswald's abdomen, and uh, Oswald was later pronounced dead at the hospital. So why was Oswald set free from all the charges? Well, as you and I know, the law no longer has dominion over a dead man, right? You're not going to drag a dead man to court, and you know there's nothing else that you can do with him. He's dead. And that is Paul's point here 
in the book of Romans chapter 7 that the law has no dominion any longer over a dead man. In fact, here in Romans chapter 7, Paul explains the believer's relationship to the law, the law of God. In fact, the word law appears 23 times in chapter 7, 14 times in the first 12 verses alone that we're going to be looking at this morning. We began a new section in Romans chapter 6. In Romans 6, 7, and 8, Paul's theme is sanctification. We looked at that word a little bit last week. It's the Greek word hagiosmos. It comes from the root hagios, which means holy, consecrated, pure, sanctified. It means to be set apart. And that's what Paul is getting at now, that we have been set apart. Last week, remember, uh, we talked about sanctification. Paul believes that sanctification, he taught sanctification in two ways. Number one is that we are sanctified. That is our position in Christ. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus, God, now sees you and I, the believer, as sanctified. We are holy. We are consecrated, set apart. And we are that positionally. Hebrews 10.10 10, for you note takers, tells us that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But Paul also taught regarding sanctification that it is also a process. Though positionally God sees us as holy, yet we are in our actions and in our practice still very much unholy, right? Uh, we still commit sin. And so there's a process in which we are becoming more and more set apart from the world, from our sinful nature, and to God. We are becoming more and more holy practically. And <clears throat> Hebrews 10.14 tells us by one offering... Speaking of the offering of Jesus, He, Jesus, has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We're in that process. And so Paul devotes a whole chapter here to our relationship now to the law. And he tells us what the law was powerless to do, Jesus has done. Jesus Christ has accomplished. And so our sanctification is not through the keeping of the law, not through any works that we could do, not through any rituals or regulations or you know, standards that we need to keep. The only way that we have become sanctified is through our faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work upon the cross and His grace now that has been extended to us. And so I want to look with you this morning in... 12 verses at four things. Number one, if you're taking notes, notice in verse one, a truth stated. A truth stated. And notice what Paul says in verse one. He says, Or do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law. And so he's speaking to Christians. He calls us brethren. And he's speaking to those who know the law. Uh, any Jews or any Christian brothers and sisters who understand the law. That the law, he says, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And we kind of opened up with that, didn't we? As long as we're alive. As long as we have breath in our lungs, the law has power over us. But when we die, the law no longer has power over us. That was the case with Lee Harvey Oswald and so it is the case with any human being and all human beings in the relationship to the law. Now, in Romans chapter 6, remember Paul made his case that you and I, the believer, we have died to sin in Christ Jesus. We were buried with Him in our baptism. Remember, we identified with Christ through baptism. 
Before that, before being water baptized, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit in just putting our faith in Jesus Christ. We have been united with Jesus Christ in His death, His burial, but also in His resurrection to a new life. And so what Paul here is going to be declaring to us this morning is that we're no longer under the law, we're under grace. We no longer have to do things to try to please God, but just because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been made friends with God. We're no longer His enemies. We're no longer working against Him. We're working with Him. We're working for Him. And we're serving Him. And it's a relationship of grace. And so our relationship to the law has changed. We're no longer working to please God through works, but how? We're abiding now in a love relationship with the Lord. And we desire to please Him. You know, I look at it this way in my devotional life. Sometimes we look at our Bible reading and our prayer times as, man, I I have to read my Bible rather than I get to read my Bible. I get to know the Lord. You know, I, I have to pray or I have to read so many chapters rather than I get to learn about my Savior. You know, I, I know some of you here are young and maybe don't have any girlfriends or boyfriends. Uh, But for some of us that have dated and maybe even found a spouse and we've married, uh, for me, I remember getting to know my wife before we were married and we started dating and courting. I mean, we didn't have cell phones back then. We had to dial, punch in, you know, and it was connected to the wall. You couldn't take it with you. But, I mean, we talked for hours getting to know each other. We didn't have uh, the internet, I don't think, when we first started dating and uh, uh, social media and so forth, texting back and forth. And so it was all on the phone or we drove and we met each other and we dated. And, you know, it it was not, oh, man, I have to get to know this girl. No, I wanted to get to know her. I desired to get to know her because out of love, we loved each other and we were falling in love with each other. And so our relationship with the Lord is a love relationship. It's not I got to get to know Him. It's I get to get to know Him. I get to spend time with Him. I remember as a teenager, one of the chores that my father had for me was I had to wash his car on the weekends. And it was one of the chores I would, you know, wet it down, get the suds and the sponge out and, you know, wipe the dirt off that thing, rinse it. And one of the things that he was real particular about is in cleaning the windows, he didn't want any streaks on the windows. And that's kind of like a rule, right? Hey, no streaks. I knew he was going to come out and look at my work. And I often didn't want to be there, obviously, right? Who wants to do your chores as a kid? You want to be, you know, out, you know, playing uh, sports with your friends or out in the theater watching, you know, the latest Star Wars or Indiana Jones flick, you know? That's where I wanted to be, but I had to get my chores done. And I learned to get it done the first time because if there were streaks on the windows, then he would have me do it over again. But let's just say that my father knew that I had a girlfriend and he said, David, I know you want to take your girl out and so guess what? If you want to wash the car, here's the keys. You could take it out and you could take your girl out on a a date. And of course, if that is the case, I'm not going to be burdensome in cleaning that car. I mean, I'm going to go to town on that car, right? I mean, I'm going to clean that thing up good. Because it's out of love now. And it's a different relationship now, you know, that I have. And I, and I want to transform that car into a thing of beauty because of my love. And so the law made me wash the car, but love makes me do it with pleasure. And that's our relationship, you know, with the Lord now. That's the whole idea of the law. God gave the law to provide instructions on how 
man, in particular the Jews, are to relate to God, to have fellowship with God. And God knew that man would break the law. And so he provided a way in which their sin could be covered. And it was through the sacrificial system. They had to bring an offering. And they had to bring an animal that would be a substitutionary sacrifice. That, his, that animal's blood would be shed. But even through the sacrificial system, the blood of that animal only covered their sin for a year. It didn't take away their sin. Hebrews 10.4 tells us it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. And that's why Jesus, a body was prepared for the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. And He became a human like us so that He in His perfect life could be a sacrifice for our sins. And it not only His sacrifice not only covered, but it washed away. It took away our sin completely. You see, Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 says this, every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And the purpose of that term, meaning that he sat down, signifies that his work was complete. That he, for one time, offered one offering, his own body, for the sacrifice of all sins of all humanity. And so the truth is what? In Christ, we have died with him to sin. We're no longer under the old relationship to the law but it's, we're now under grace, this grace that God has given to us in Jesus Christ. Well, that brings us to the second point. Notice, secondly, in verse 2 and 3, that Paul also gives us a, an illustration here, an illustration given uh, through marriage. In verse 2, he says, notice, for the woman ha who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. And so Paul's now going to illustrate for us the power of the law as it relates to the marriage relationship. You see, under the law, a marriage was for eternity, or, or rather, uh, for life, as the vow is, until death do us part. And so, in other words, it was to be for your entire life. Uh, it's interesting that the woman in Paul's day could not divorce her husband. But the husband could divorce the wife. And in fact, it, the laws became very liberal that the man often would desire to divorce his wife for a lot of reasons. She oversalted the meat or she burnt the beans or maybe he just wanted a younger model and so he would want to trade her in for a younger model. And there were various you know, uh, uh, priests, two groups, in, in fact, two camps of priests that had very liberal, loose laws regarding marriage, and yet there was one other priest that had more strict laws. And so Jesus later on would tell us in Matthew 19 that, you know, that the marriage vow was to be till death do you part. He didn't want, you know, in the beginning with Adam and Eve, God's desire was that you would be with one spouse for your entire life. You weren't supposed to, you know, have different wives or different marriages and remarriages and so forth. In fact, in the book of Malachi, which we'll be studying on Wednesday nights, the Bible and God specifically tells us that God hates divorce. The breaking up of uh, a couple that God has joined together. And so death, here as Paul tells us, he gives us an illustration. He says death ends the marriage obligation. Death breaks the marriage contract. And Paul 
is in his argument throughout Romans chapter 6, remember, tells us that we died with Christ. And so what he's going to be relating to us ultimately is that we died to the law. You know, we had a separation, uh, that relationship, marriage relationship, if you will, uh, to the law has been broken. We now have a new partner in Jesus Christ because we've died with Christ. And so we now have a, a new partner who is Jesus Christ. But let me just address real quickly uh, these issues that, you know, kind of Paul draws to, even though we don't want to focus on them this morning. You know, I mentioned marriage is intended for as long as you both shall live till death do you part. Not till debt. Debt do you part, right? Uh, you get a bunch of bills and you're like, all right, I'm done. I'm out of here. Uh, you know, one of the people in the marriage contract is spending too much and, you know, ringing up all the credit cards. It's not till debt do you part. It's till death do you part. But let me tell you that there are three biblical outs, way outs in marriage that the Bible declares to us. Number one, as Paul declares here, is adultery. And Jesus later would also declare in Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, that if one of the spouses in a marriage relationship is living in unrepentant adultery, then the other spouse is free, you know, to move on. They don't want to, you know, quit committing adultery. They have an issue. They have a problem. And so that was a way out that God gave for the husband or the wife. And then secondly, in 1 Corinthians 7.15, Paul declares if you have an unbelieving spouse and that unbelieving spouse wants to leave you or divorce you, then you're to let them go. But if they want to stay in the relationship, then stay because your witness, your testimony can win them over. But if they're unbelieving and they're tired of your Christian witness, they're tired of you putting tracks, Bible tracks in their sandwiches, right? You're trying to win them over. And, you know, they want to leave you or they just want to, you know, they're tired of you not wanting to do the things that they want to do, sin with them, and so they want to leave. Paul says, hey, if they want to leave, then you're free to let them, them go and to divorce you if that's the case. And then the third one, of course, is if the spouse dies, you're out. You know, you're free to remarry, but only in the Lord are you free to marry. In other words, you're not to marry an unbeliever. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And that includes marriage, you know, uh, business. We want to make wise business decisions. And so we need to be wise in who we do business with and especially who we marry. And so <clears throat> Paul now is uh, going to make application. That's our third point, verse 4 through 6. Notice now Paul is going to make application concerning our being united with Christ in his death and our remarriage, we are the bride of Christ. He is our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Notice verse 4, our third point this morning, an application made. He says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him, speaking of Jesus, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. And again, this is the argument that Paul was making in chapter 6, that we have died. We have died with Christ in His burial, in the tomb, in His resurrection. We have been raised to a new life. And so when we died with Christ, we died to the rule of the law over our life in the sense that you know, uh, we're not working now to please God. How do we please God now? Just simply by loving Him and being united together with Him in fellowship through the Spirit as His children, as His sons and daughters. And so, notice that he says here in verse 4 that we have been married to another, to Him, speaking of Jesus, who was raised from the dead. And then he says that we should bear 
fruit to God. Notice he doesn't say that we should work for God. But he talks about bearing fruit to God. It's not the works that God requires from us as much as it's the fruit that God desires from us. And how does a tree bear fruit? Have you ever walked by a tree, maybe an apple or an orange tree, and heard that tree straining and working to produce fruit? You see the green oranges that are going to turn orange, and you hear the orange tree groaning, trying to turn those fruit orange? No, we don't hear that, do we? How does that fruit turn from green to orange? Simply by hanging on the branch, right? Just like Jesus said in John 15, regarding us bearing fruit, he says what? If you abide in me, the word abide simply means remain. Just remain connected to the Lord. Continually fellowshipping and coming to the Lord and loving on the Lord. He said in John 15, 4, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides or remains in the vine. Neither can you, he says, unless you abide in me. And so just by hanging in there, staying connected, we're going to bear fruit. And that fruit is going to glorify the Lord. Listen to what Sandy Adams said. I love this quote. He says, Under the law, the issue is the sin in my life. But under grace, the issue is the Son in my life. You see, there's a different focus. It's the Son, Jesus Jesus Christ and fellowshipping with Him. He goes on, and I don't have the whole quote for you on the screens, but this is what he says. He says, It's the joy I find in Jesus that lessens sin's appeal and neutralizes its temptation. He says, I progress as a Christian by believing my sin has been dealt with on the cross and preoccupying myself with following the Son, not fighting the sin. You see, I've told you before, I think, it takes a passion to conquer a passion. Not that we hate sin more, but that we love Jesus more. We need to preoccupy ourselves with the Lord. And and you know what? If you just focus on the Lord and loving Him and fellowshipping with Him, it's going to be easier to please Him and to love Him and to not think about those sins that are constantly and continue to come back and to knock at our door. You see, the the key church is, is being preoccupied with the Lord and knowing Him, and getting to know Him, and to love Him. Notice what verse 5 and 6 says. He goes on. He says, For when we were, notice, past tense, in the flesh, because now, and we'll get to this later, but uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through the rest of the chapter, talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Since we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In other words, we're no longer in the flesh. And the term flesh, by the way, that Paul is going to use often, speaks of our sinful nature. When we were bound by sin, when we were slaves to sin. And so he's talking about when we were, past tense, in the flesh and being ruled by our sinful passions. He says, those sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Verse 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You see, when we were joined to God, we were joined to Him so that we could bear fruit to God. Holiness, sanctification, goodness. We were bearing fruit towards Christ-likeness. But I don't have to tell you that when we were in the flesh, in in the old life, when the old man was ruling, we were serving sin. We were serving Satan and we were bearing fruit to disobedience. 
And notice what Paul says here. He says that the sinful passions in verse 5 were aroused by the law. And isn't it true, you guys could probably relate to this, that when you see a law that says what? Don't touch wet paint. What does that do? It arouses your sinful passions, your rebelliousness, right? Because you could have walked right past that park bench and not had a desire to touch it. But because that sign on the bench says, don't touch wet paint, it's like, well, how wet is it, right? How long has it been drying, you know? And you kind of touch it, then you're, you put your fingerprint on it because it's still a little wet. Or don't walk on the grass, you know, right? And you're kind of tempted now. You know, you, ne- you weren't even tempted until you saw the sign. Interesting, I uh, read the story in uh, Chuck Swindoll's commentary. He was talking about a hotel in Galveston, Texas, right on the beach. And the hotel staff was worried that the people would want to drop their fishing lines from their balconies into the water. And so what did they do? They put signs up in the balcony that says, absolutely no fishing from the balcony. And of course, what happened? People would have never thought of fishing. But now that they have the sign, they say, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Let's go get some, you know, a rod and from the local store and some tackle. And, and sure enough, you know, they were tossing their, you know, their fishing lines over. High winds sometimes. They had, you know, in the lower level, they had a restaurant. And, and every so often, they would get like one of the weights from the fishing lines smacking against the plate gas, glass windows because people were tossing, the, you know, their lines over. Well, here's how they fixed the problem. You guessed it. They removed the signs. And then they didn't have a problem anymore. Nobody was tempted. You see, just as Paul says here, the law arouses our sinful passions. It tempts us, you know. We would have never thought about fishing from the balcony unless the law said, the the sign said, don't fish from the balcony. And so God gave us the law for two reasons. Number one, to expose our sin and to declare, to confront our sins and to let us know that, yes, we're sinners. We need to repent and turn from our sin and turn to God. It exposes not only our sin, but our need for God. And then secondly, the law exposes our sinfulness. It arouses our rebellious actions. And it shows our nature to sin so that we would realize that we need the Lord. And of course, we need the power of the Holy Spirit, this newness of life that God has given to us. Now, Paul might have felt like his Jewish readers might have misunderstood what he's saying about the law here. And so, notice lastly, as we look at this last point, he wants to clarify where he stands regarding the law. He doesn't want any of his Jewish readers to think that he was equating the law with sin or with evil, stating that the law is evil. And so notice lastly, fourthly, my last point, Paul is going to give a defense of the law, a defense declared in verse 7 through 12. Notice verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? And of course he answers as he normally does here in Romans. Certainly not. No way. No way, Jose. May it never be. Of course the law isn't sin. And he's going to explain now that the law uh, has a purpose though. And it has served its intended purpose, which was to bring us to Christ. To show us the sinfulness of our sin. The sinfulness of our flesh, our sinful, carnal nature. And then notice he goes on and he says what? On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness 
unless the law had said, you shall not covet. And so Paul brings up covetousness as uh, something that really convicted him. And it's interesting, you know, when you think about the Ten Commandments, which we could never keep, right? And we, we've probably all broken many of the Ten Commands. Thievery, lust, you know, after a man or a woman in our hearts. The Lord says we've already committed the sin of adultery if we've lusted in our heart. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of those commands, though, are acts that we commit with our bodies. But if you think about covetousness, covetousness is an evil desire that begins in our mind and our heart, desiring something that is not ours. And this is what got Paul, he says, I would have not have known the sin of covetousness except the law said don't covet. And like we talked about before, when the law says don't covet, what happens? We start coveting things. You start looking over your neighbor at his Harley and say, man, I wish I had a Harley. Well, look at his green grass. I want green grass like that. I wish my house had two stories and, you know, stuff like that. Five-car garage, right? Who has that? Anyways, some people do. But we start coveting those things. Looking at the Kardashians, right? Watching that TV program. Man. Why don't I have, drive a car like that, you know? And we start coveting all these things. And so the commandment has revealed who we are. Our sinfulness. And you know, I like to look at it this way. You know, the law is very much like an MRI machine, right? We go under that machine and it tells you what's wrong with your body, whether you have cancer, where it's located. Now, is the MRI machine bad? No. It's not what gave you cancer. It's just telling you that there is a cancer in your body. And that's what the law does. It reveals our sinfulness. It tells us that we have a deadly disease that if we don't take care of it, if we don't find a cure for it, then we're going to die. And that's what the law does. It doesn't cause sin, our sinful nature, our desire to sin that we have innately within of us, in us. The disease of sin is what causes us to sin. And then notice verse 8 and 9, he goes on and he says, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And so as I mentioned, the law isn't what causes death, but my sin, my ability to break the law and my inability to keep the law. And so notice he says, sin uses the law as an opportunity. And, in, and truly when there's no law, there's no breaking of the law. But when there is a law, then our sinful nature either, you know, either desires to keep it or we are tempted and aroused to break it. And so Paul says, once the commandment exists, we have that opportunity now to break it. And sin, of course, even the sin of covetousness goes all the way back to Adam and Eve because she desired that piece of fruit as something to make her wise. She coveted it. And, the, and we know that sin is deceitful. It lies. You see, sin falsely promises satisfaction. Sin falsely promises that it is good. It is pleasurable. But it hides the hook, doesn't it? It hides the end. It hides the sting of death. Sin falsely accuses God of being a party pooper. Man, you just don't want me to have fun, God. That's why you put all these laws in the book, right? But of course, God knows that sin will kill you. It'll destroy you. It'll ruin you. And He's protecting us. And so sin lies to us. And that's why we need to be careful regarding sin because it is deceitful. And it could deceive you. 
Listen to what Paul wrote in Hebrews 3.13. He tells us the church to exhort one another daily while it is called today. And then he says this, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. Well, let's bring this to a close. Verse 10 and 12. Notice what he says. He says, And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, verse 12, notice he says, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. You see, the law of God, it was thought to bring life. Why? God said, if you obey me, then you'll continue to live. You'll, you'll be blessed. But if you disobey me, you know, then the curses will come. And so obeying God, we would think, hey, it would, it would, in, it would br bring us life and a good life. But of course, we could never obey the commands perfectly. And so even though the law was supposed to bring life, it didn't give us eternal life in the sense that it didn't bring salvation. It didn't forgive us of our sins. But is there something wrong with the law? No, there's nothing wrong with the law of God. It's God's law. It came from God. The problem is with us. There's something wrong with us, deeply wrong with us. It's our heart. Our sinful heart. Listen to what Jeremiah 17.9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord says, I the Lord know it. I search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You see, you know, we don't need more laws to make us holy. We need more of Jesus. We need more of his grace and his love and his mercy. The law simply shows us our need for Jesus, but the law was insufficient. It was powerless to make us perfect. It was powerless to forgive our sins. And so Paul declares, notice in verse 12, that the law is holy. Then the commandment is holy. The law speaks of the five books of Moses, the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The commandment speaks of the individual commandments within the law. And Paul tells us what? They are holy. They are just. They are right. They are good. The law is good. It's us that are sinful, our inability to keep the law. The law declared, thou shalt not steal. What's wrong with that? Nothing. The law said, thou, thou shalt not kill. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. The law said, thou shalt not lie. What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. The law said, thou shalt not commit adultery. What's wrong with that law? Nothing. God is preserving. He's protecting us. You see, the problem isn't the law. It's our inability to keep it. And so God gave the law to bring us to Him to demonstrate our need for salvation, our desire to repent and to find salvation. And once a person finds salvation, we have a new relationship now to the law and to the Lord. And we are now under God's grace through faith. The law has served its purpose in bringing us to Christ. And so what's our goal in life now? As a believer, your goal, my goal, my desire, my heart is to come to Christ and to know Him. My focus needs to be in coming to Christ, in desiring Christ. You see, we can't improve upon ourselves through regulations and rituals and laws. The only person that can sanctify you is the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. It's not through your self-will and how self-disciplined you are or how much you pray or read your Bible. We need to have a different focus in our devotional life. You know, so many times it's, man, I have to read so many chapters. We close the book and we forget what we read. But we need to have a different focus. You see, Paul 
is giving us a portrait here of himself, his own misery and struggle in the flesh, and even with the law. We'll see that a little bit next week. But he's given us this self-portrait to demonstrate that humanity can't do more to purify himself, either before salvation or after salvation. We need the Holy Spirit. We need this relationship with Jesus Christ to purify us. You see, Paul had an eye problem. I want to do right, but I continue to do wrong. You see, the words I, me, and myself in chapter 7 appear 47 times. I, me, myself, you know. It was, it, it, that's the flesh. It's all about us. And that's the worst type of eye problem that we could have. Worse than cataracts, farsightedness, nearsightedness. It's just, and it's all about ourselves. We need to realize that Jesus, it's all about Jesus. And if we're going to progress in our Christian walk, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's the key, church. I want to leave you with this this morning. If you get anything here, our duty as believers is just to recognize that it's all about the grace of God. And it's all about Jesus. Our purpose should be to know Jesus personally and intimately and to grow in that knowledge of Him. To grow in that knowledge of Him. Remember I was talking about the whole dating thing. And just realize that as the bride of Christ, Christ is our bridegroom, we should desire to get to know Him And everything that we do in our Christian life should be to know Him. If we are trying to sanctify ourselves through more prayer or fasting or the study of Scripture or tithing or any other spiritual discipline, it should be for the purpose of knowing Christ more. If we're opening the Bible, it should be for the purpose of knowing the Lord more. His mind his heart. Not for ourselves, you know. I need to fast. I need to be more disciplined. Hey, you should be fasting to get to know the Lord more. Praying to get to know the Lord more. To fellowship with Him. To express your heart to Him. If we're worshiping together, fellowshipping, breaking bread, praying together, it should be so that we could get to know how God transforms others. Because He's going to transform us many times in the same way. Getting to know the Lord. As we minister to one another, whether it's the homeless, the fatherless, the widow, the weak, or comforting the sick, the lost, or the lonely, it should be that we're walking in the sandals of our Lord so that we could know of His love and His mercy and His grace and extend that to others. It shouldn't be for ourselves. As we seek to know the Lord, you're going to get to know the Holy Spirit that is the one who empowers you and gives you the strength to do ministry. And so in the next chapter, chapter 8, we're going to get to know the person and the work of the Holy Spirit a little bit more. Is He's the one who gives us the power, the strength to do what He's called us to do. But I want us to focus this morning and hopefully maybe change our focus, not so much on doing things for others, except focusing on getting to know the Lord and seeking Him first and His righteousness and letting Him bless you as you get to know Him. Fall in love with Him afresh this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Josh to come back up. Maybe we'll close in one final song. But, you know, if you want to respond to this, maybe in our hearts this morning, we could just recommit our lives to the Lord. Maybe we've acquired idols that we've put before the Lord. Maybe we've broke laws in our hearts. The law has aroused, you know, our rebellion this week. And we've been heading, you know, in a different direction away from the Lord. And why don't we just, as we worship together with this final song, just spend some time And just talking to the Lord in our hearts and just saying to the Lord, Lord, forgive me. 
My focus has been elsewhere, and I need to focus on you. Would you give me that love for you that surpasses all loves? Maybe there's a a rival throne that you've exalted in your heart where God wants to be. Like he said to the church of Ephesus, you've left your first love. And we want to put Jesus Christ right there back in his proper place and make him first and foremost in our life. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. We pray that you would continue, Lord, to direct our lives and direct our heart. As we look into your word, Father, we recognize that we have been united together with you through your death, your burial, and your resurrection. We realize, Lord, that we have died to our old life and resurrected to a new life that you have given to us by your Holy Spirit who lives within us now. And Lord, it's by your Holy Spirit we desire to be in fellowship with you and be aware of your presence constantly in our life. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. Father, help us to realize that you're always with us. And Lord, help us to grow in our knowledge of you. Everything that we do, we want to do it for you and unto you and with you. Help us not to present our members of our body, our eyes, our hands, our feet, our ears, our mouth. Help us not to present these things as instruments of sin and wickedness, but as instruments of righteousness, Lord, to do your bidding, to do your work, to please you, our Master, our Savior, our gentle King and loving Savior. Father, will you give us more grace? Lord, your word says that you give grace to the humble, the broken, the contrite, but you resist the proud. Father, we humble ourselves before you to declare to you that we need you so much each day, each week. Father, we need you to pour out your grace upon us, Father, so that we could be used by you throughout this week, so that we could draw others to you, point others to you with this transformed, changed, delivered life that you brought to us by your grace. May others around us see your love working in us, changing us and renewing us. We want to surrender afresh to you this morning. Would you do that in us, Lord? Would you fill us afresh with your Spirit, transforming us, Lord, into that Christ-like image, your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. May all those characteristics of your Son, Jesus Christ, be seen in your church, Lord. We need you. We need more of you. Bless us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I will bow before the cross, cherish my Redeemer's cost. There is nothing I can do, but only stand amazed by you. In mercy new with every day, wrapped up in your arms of grace. Nothing more, you're all I need.